Episode 22 of the New England Sports Media Podcast features Brendan Hall, content producer and marketer for Huddle, but also a longtime New England sports journalist uh, with The Globe and ESPN Boston and NBC Sports Boston and really pretty much every media outlet in the region. Brendan, thanks for joining us. Yeah, two-time mayor of uh, Tennessee, they call me. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So we're taping this a um, couple nights before Thanksgiving. Uh, before we started recording, we were talking a little bit about Thanksgiving football. Obviously, Brendan, you've covered uh, years and years of it. Um, tell us about maybe just some of your experiences covering Thanksgiving football and just your opinion on you know why – it matters to you and maybe how it's the interest of it has changed uh, during your lifetime. Yeah. I'll say, I'll start with the interest. I think that's where this, this really um, is, a, is the crux. It's kind of like, I think once they started having state championships at Gillette stadium and really once they started going to this uh, true state tournament format, I mean, you, you, you ask any kid, what would you rather do uh, win on Thanksgiving or win at Gillette stadium? I don't think it's a question. I think it's 10 out of 10. You know, the kids want to, they, they want to win at the home of Tom Brady and, and, and what, and the amount of teams that, you know, are set up, you know, to play at Gillette that sit starters on Thanksgiving is testament to that. Right. Um, there's some rivalries that just are never going to, never going to die. Right. You know, like the variant St. John's prep, the fact that they're always playing the kids on Thanksgiving and usually one of them's in a state title game and they don't care. I, I think that's so, that's so hardcore. That's so badass. Um, you know, coming from experience, um, you know, Thanksgiving football was so huge growing up. I, I come from an area of Massachusetts that, um, you know, at the turn of the century, it was really, really, uh, you talk about some teams like Fitchburg um, back in the day. Um, they'd go into Brockton and shout out Brockton. They'd go to Zavarian, shout out Zavarian. Um, it really, it, it was some of the best football being played in the state in North Central Massachusetts. And that Fitchburg Lawrence a rivalry, 10, 15,000 people, Philip Crocker Field or Doyle Field, wherever. And it was just, I, I mean, that was, that was bragging rights at each other's townie bars for the rest of the year, right? That was like, you, you'd see some kid at the party, hey, you know, you'd be afraid to wear your jacket, right? One of those things. Um, and I and and the rivalry I played in was really good too. Um, Oakmont Regional High School versus Gardner High School, um, two town, the two schools that are about four miles apart. And you know we weren't very good my junior and senior years, but beating Gardner on Thanksgiving um, redeemed the whole season in a lot of ways. Um, so th th there's for those rivalries that have been around forever that are really intense tribalism from town border to town border. I think there's still a lot of meaning there. But I, I look at some of these rivalries um, and you just see the dwindling attendance. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to be a detective and be like, well, is, is, is uh, you know, is, is, is the town uh, nature change? Is, I, I, I just think um, we're in different times now. And, and I think just that, that I, I like the end of the tunnel, that, that, that specter of, of being able to play at the house that Brady built. Um, I don't know, for a lot of kids, it's, it's really cool. And I don't know, but Thanksgiving football is always one of my favorite days of the year. This is the first time in like 15, 16 years I'm not doing any Thanksgiving football. Uh, but that was always my favorite night of the year is going on uh, Fox 25 with uh, my two favorite people, Tom Ladden and Butch Stearns and talking football and busting their balls on TV and uh, having a little leftover turkey and then waiting to go buy a TV at Target at one o'clock in the morning or something. Um, getting off topic, but um yeah, it's, 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 it's changed uh, a, a little bit. I, but I, I, I said this from the day that they, that they instituted state championships at Gillette, like that true statewide format and people talked about it. I said, the good rivalries will survive, you know, because they were always playing for something that didn't have a playoff title on the line. Um, but I, I think this idea of just scheduling a Thanksgiving game for filling out a schedule was, was going to be, you know, you had, you're going to have to do away with that. Um, let me go and survive. Like I was telling you guys right before we went on the air here, like Kyler Murray, Allen, Texas, um, the, the eyes of the Lone Star State on him had 28 teammates that ended up playing Division One football. Okay, we're lucky to have 10 in a good year here. But what, what we have that I really don't think any other part of the country has is that just town border to town border tribalism. 
you know, I, I, I live in Framingham here, right? Framingham, Natick is a big rivalry, right? Natick hates Walpole. Walpole hates Foxborough. Foxborough hates Mansfield. Mansfield hates Franklin. Uh, Franklin hates, I don't know, Milford. Milford probably hates Algonquin, who hates St. John's. Well, everyone hates St. John's up there. But, um, you know, you don't have that in other parts of the country, the way you do, or just the intensity you, that you do here. Um, and so I think that's what, that's what always made these robbery games on Thanksgiving, you know, special. So, yeah, I mean, it's cool because in a lot of these towns, like I'm from Newton, it's a little bit different. It's more like transient, as you said, but a lot of these towns, like people grow up in the town and they stay there and their kids go to the same school they went to play football and just kind of happens like that. Yeah. Look, my, my wife is from South Carolina and <laughs> it's funny, the, when I first when I when we first started dating and I was explaining to her how this whole thing works and 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 how it's a huge problem now because of the state championship games and she was like why don't you just have them on Labor Day weekend I was like well that's kind of brilliant <laughs> you know <laughs> I mean think think about Labor Day weekend right in in in, in non pandemic times that's usually like the kind of the, the kickoff weekend for football right you have college football kicking off um, the NFL usually somewhere around there and and um, we don't start till after Labor Day, and I always, I always thought, given the the the, the wave of momentum across country, there was there was a missed opportunity there not to start your season around there. Um, but oh, well, Liam, where, are you Newton, North Newton South? What are you? Newton South, Newton South. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. snooze, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I, I just again, I I just think um, to your point, Liam. Yeah, there, there's we're very proud of where we're from up here. Um, and you go to other parts of the country and it's like, um, I, I think Kurt Vonnegut had a great term for this years ago, grand falloon, right? I'm a Hoosier. Well, what's a Hoosier? I don't know, but we're Hoosiers, you know? And, um, you know, where, where I work uh, at, at Huddle, which is based in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I have to go out there for a, a few times a year for, for work-related stuff. And uh, last time I was out there, I, I, bumped into a, a guy who works for Huskers who's from um, uh, Rehoboth, Mass. And oh, wow. it, it was like we were cousins. It, it, there's just something special about growing up here. And and I think that does translate into just some of the, the pride they have and for their uh, for their town-to-town rivalries, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you could probably speak a little bit to this. Like when you're covering f- football around here, you know, it's a lot of history. It's yeah. a lot of knowing the towns, knowing the rivalries. But when you're – if you're covering football in Nebraska or Allen, Texas, covering guys like Kyler Murray and stuff, is it more about like, all right, what kids are in the pipeline, what kids are transferring schools and stuff like that? Like, what's the main difference there, you think? Yeah, I think that's a good one. I think the I think certainly the recruiting attention is is big. Um, and because a lot of these fans are also like really, really into college football, right? I, I mean, we, we we think we're we're into it you know, following BC up here, it's, that's absolutely nothing compared to the, like the SEC schools or, or the big 12 or, you know, stuff. I mean, even, even, even Lincoln, Nebraska, where, where, you know, where Huddle is, um, boy, it, 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 you better be careful what you say about Scott Frost inside those building walls. Um, you might offend somebody. Uh, it, it is like, uh, you know, they, they take it really seriously, really, really seriously. And so, yeah, recruiting is definitely a, a, a big part of that. Um, and and a guy like a guy like Colin Murray, who really came to his own as like like earlier in his high school career than most you know quarterbacks that plays like Allen do, and he had the whole eyes of Texas on him for straight up two years recruiting wise. And so, um, just imagine the kind of pressure you are under from there. I mean, we're talking about a part of the country where, and I I, I one of the newspapers out there they have it. They print it every year, but just the, the top salaries of high school football coaches across the state. And we're talking 150, 160 guys at company cars, just to coach the football team. Um, you know, here we get we get guys that are they're uh, you know, I don't know what they're making, but a lot of these guys, it's it's a labor of love, right? So um some of the some of the setup these guys have. Um I, I mean, Allen, Allen, Texas. Uh, I mean, you, you're talking 20 or 30 assistant coaches. Guys, all have they all have laptops after the game. They're already making their playlists for their positions, and it's it's really really intense. Um, recruiting is certainly a big part of that, no question. No. So, obviously, your career, you know, 
mostly journalism, sports journalism stuff. Now you're at Huddle. Um, how did you like end up at Huddle? Like, what skills kind of transferred? What skills did you have to learn? And what is your experience like on the on the flip side of like changing over? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I, you know, I go back to ESPN Boston, and um, you know, it was, it's got the ESPN name to it, but for all intents and purposes, this was a startup, right? Um, I, I'm coming into there fresh with, um, you know, right out of the right out of the gate with like a staff of two people. Uh, I got to go out there and compete with Danny Ventura, compete with Bob Holmes, um, and and make it work. And so, really, my position was writer slash editor, um, but you know, very quickly became writer, editor, photographer, videographer, uh, and then we had a sales staff that was working on sponsorship activations that. We're helping close forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of sponsorships a year, uh, but like I had to put, I had to really learn how to build my brand organically. And you know, as that wore on, I was, I was like, you know what, I, I really think I could be a good marketer. And will you hold on one second? I got my kids crying. Hold on. Yeah, take your time. No worries. It's back. Yeah, I just I want to say like before we start, it's a good point to to jump in here. Like when I was at Newton South in 2016, it was like the, I feel like it was like the height of ESP in Boston. I remember I was on the basketball team and I remember you put us at like 15 on your top 20 and it was like the biggest deal ever. Like you guys were, you guys were the shit then. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the best thing I can say about ESP in Boston, it's about two or three years into it. And my father um, was interviewing for, for a, uh, a job in Detroit, Michigan. And gets off the plane and meets the guy who ended up being his future boss. First question wasn't like, Hey, how you doing? And he goes, I heard your son's Brennan Hall. Um, I'm from Natick. Can you explain to me why Troy Floyd wasn't a Mr. Football finalist this year? I, I, I mean, we had, that, we had that kind of feel. Um, <laughs> I can, I can, I can get so into the weeds and some like some of the, as big as it was locally, like, you guys were only 20% of the traffic, like people all over the country were checking in with us to check on their old hometown. Like I talk about that tribalism, that, that kind yeah. of green saloon. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'll start back from the top. Um, so, you know, when, when we started the ESPN Boston in, in, in 2010, um, you know, I was kind of given the keys to the car and kind of a, a, a blank canvas uh, with which to create. And I had a lot of, I, I had a lot of creative card plunge. And, um, you know, my title was writer slash editor, but very quickly it became writer, editor, photographer, videographer, um, radio host, podcast host, uh, you know, showing up at the game of the week uh, tent, you know, giving out free giveaways, um, like marketer, strategizer, sponsorship salesman, everything. Yeah, I still got one of those koozies floating around. They, 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 I'll tell you what, the headbands were a huge hit, surprisingly. Um, I don't know if you remember the year that Cambridge won the state title with Jakari Doughton, but he wore an ESPN Boston headband for every game. And yeah. I I got to be honest, when, when he would show up in the picture of the globe with the ESPN Boston headband, I was like, oh, my goodness, punk rock, we won. <laughs> um, uh, no, but, but um, it, it, you know, it, it was it was kind of cool, like, social media was obviously a huge part of what we did. Um, and, and I think we got into that before our competitors really got into the weeds on it. And, and, you know, we, we had a little bit of an advantage. Um, and it was really a hands-on lesson in brand building. And, and it was a much better education in how to build a brand than anything you'll ever learn in that classroom. Right. And because we, there was no other option. The only option was to succeed. And so, and, 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 that, and believe it or not, the liberations that come with that kind of objective uh, are actually quite revealing. Um, and so, so along the way, as I'm building my brand, as we're getting four, four and a half million page views a year, as we're averaging more daily traffic on the high school page than the Bruins page or the Celtics page, I, I started to really believe that like, I, I kind of fell in love with marketing and, and just that whole idea of it. And I, I, you know, I, as my career wore on, I'm like, you know, if I ever got a chance to kind of make that transition, 
and be honest with you, I, I feel like I would have made a transition like this uh, last couple of years, whether it was Huddle or Al's Plumbing. I mean, I just the idea of of the science of it, the um, just just this just, just the, the creative side of it um, was something I thought I'd be pretty good at. And um, I, had, I had a great connection here at Huddle from someone I'd, I'd worked with in the building at Gillette Stadium, um, who really. Uh, knocked down a lot of doors for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I think it's it, my, a lot of my skills have translated well, certainly with the storytelling aspect of it. Um, you know, I, I, I think one, one thing that I would say, because people are so, I feel like right now people are kind of at a crossroads about the industry, right? It's kind of changed so rapidly the last couple of years. And um, I think people, have questions about the future i say this is there is no better opportunity for you to really pad your portfolio well and create that brand for yourself than there is in journalism um the stories you tell the portfolio you put together um you know the the, owning owning every aspect of that storytelling there's nothing like that and and there's still a great opportunity for lots of people your guys age um, to really make a name for yourself out there um and so um yeah, I, I have a blast doing this stuff. And, and um, what I, you know, the thing I, I wrote in on an auto is like, look, I know how to market to your, to your customers because I've, I've had a conversation with them every day for the last 15 years. And I know how to find those guys and tell those great stories. Um, you know, we did a whole series, my first six months at Huddle about um, guys that were like the most progressive high school coaches in the country guys who were really ahead of the curve on data and technology and i found some unbelievable guys this guy you've probably heard of him kevin kelly uh, the coach who never punts yeah this guy, this guy speaks at MIT. He, he's a genius uh, he, he speaks at mit sloan um he speaks for halliburton at, at their company outing like he's 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 incredible um hunter henry in the in, for the la chargers played for him um in high school um and it, you know it was a guy that like in my career, I always wanted to talk to that guy. Like, how did you come up with this idea? Like, what is your, what is your, what is your like approach to data and analytics? What is it? What best to our conversation in my life? <laughs> where is that school? Is he in Texas? Where it's, he uh, no, it's uh, it's Pulaski Academy. In right. Rural, so um, I think he's, I think he's lost something like, I don't know, 20, 30 games since 2000. I mean, they're, they're like a juggernaut, um, but like, yeah. So the thing is, they 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 never punt, um, and they always onside it if the score is less than twenty one, like up twenty one or down twenty one. They will always onside it, and they use a crazy variation of. It's not just like, hey, let's just let's just squib it like to the sideline and see if someone falls out. Like they have like fifteen or sixteen different types of onside kicks. They use they use some with like soccer style free position kicks with like one guy dummying the other guy coming across they'll do it with three people instead of two um about halfway through the season he recruited a girl off the girls soccer team to do the onside kicks because he thought she was a more accurate kicker like for that 10 yard space than the, the guys that he had um and and he was like well she 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 she's potentially a division one soccer player in her own right so maybe this gets her some attention i thought that was kind of genius you know um yeah. So he, he, like he never punts. He's punted twelve times since two thousand seven, and um, he always on sides if he's if the score is within twenty one. And then he did this. He started doing this thing where um, one off season he did a deep analytics dive about like what is you know one of the things say one of the biggest guarantors I think of of um, of a victory, I think in college football is, is if you have more, what's termed explosive plays. The, so plays are 15 yards or more. And so he did a lot of research about like, what is the, what play of, of all the millions of plays out there in football is the one that like is the highest guarantor of a, of a 15 yard game. And he found out it was a, a hook and ladder. So, um, if you can follow me here so, so now they do this thing where they will put laterals into the back end of a passing play so in other words they'll throw the bar they'll throw the ball 20 30 yards downfield and the guy's running for it and he's about to get tackled he'll turn around and lateral to someone behind 
um, and now and they do that like 30 or 40 times a year. They, um, two years ago, they had an All-American tight end. It's actually Hunter Henry's younger brother, um, Hudson Henry, and he was six five, so he could he could literally box out like six five two thirty. Could literally just turn around, box the guy out, and lateral it to the guy. Um, and and they did it about 30 or 40 times over the year. And uh, but that's analytics. And, that's, and so it was like my dream interview um, to talk to that guy. And so. But I, I, I know how to tell those stories because I, I had to do it for how many goddamn years for Craig Larson, like every week trying to scratch out a story. And, and you know, Craig, man, Craig is big, big on that scene setting. First 100, 200 words, you got you to gotta really nail it. And um, that has prepared me for this kind of stuff better than anything I've ever learned in a classroom at UMass, let's be honest. So... Listen, if you get the storytelling chops, that translates well to a lot of industries because we grind and we grind. So with what you're doing, are you working primarily with high school coaches or yeah. are you, you get a chance to work with the kids as well? What's it like? I don't, I don't really, I, I rarely do any messaging for kids, primarily for coaches um, and, and like small college coaches. And every now and then I, I pluck in a division one coach for a webinar. Um, I did a great webinar earlier this year with Justin Fry, the offensive coordinator at UCLA, um, stuff like that. And I also manage a lot of, uh, we have a couple uh, partnerships um, we, do, we have content with and I'll, um, those guys, I'm one of, them, one of the only guys in my department can really, really talk that crazy X and O's language with those guys. So I will guide them on the content and what it looks like. And we'll, we'll actually, um, a couple times a year, we'll look at our data in huddle. Um, I don't know if you're aware, we have a, we have a program that, you know, if you pay an extra subscription a year, um, we'll actually have a team of analysts break down all the data for you. In other words, put, the, put those stats down on the, on the data, on, on the, the place for you. And so we take that data and we analyze it and we try to look at, all right, what are the common threads between winning teams and losing teams? And last year we found 16 data points that where there was like a chasm between winning and losing. And so we'll, we'll put out a, a, a white paper. Um, and so we'll put out reports of like, here's what the data says. Here's some actions you can do that can get you on the right side of those percentages. And um, that's content that resonates really well with our, with our, our, our coaches. Um, you know, football coaches are pure hunter gatherers with information. So um, and they're always looking to, to find unique ways to, to win. So, so what type of schools are you like marketing to are, is it all like big time football type schools in Texas or like, um, you think that like Natick high school would ever get something like this? Yeah, it's interesting. So we have a, if not 99%, pretty close to 99% market share on American um, huddles disruption years ago. Um, not, not to date myself, but back in the day, if you wanted to exchange film with somebody, you go, you go meet them in the parking lot of Friendly. It's eleven o'clock at night. You open up the trunk of your car. You get some VHS tapes, and then you go back to your apartment. You try to look at it, and it's like this shaky Blair Witch stuff, and you don't know what the heck you're looking at because it's choppy. And and um, who knows? You might find a few tendencies. Um, where Huddle really came in, came in and, and disrupted was was the digitization of all that, um, and and being able to host them on a platform and really click a few buttons and send your scout tape to your opponent. And, and there goes that ugly confrontation at the friendlies parking lot. There goes that shaky Blair Witch camera. Now you just have it all in, in, in decent quality right there for you. And all you got to do is just hit a couple exchange buttons. And from that, it really became a good highlight creation tool. And I think my interest in huddle, I was a big fan of huddle long before this opportunity became a board, and a big part of this. Um, coaches would send me kids film uh, on a huddle um, to get evaluated uh, by ESPN Recruiting Nation. And from that, we did a little bit of like, you know, some telestrator videos and stuff. But, um, really, so <laughs> their ascent in the market kind of ran parallel with my ascent with my brand. Um, but really, around that 2011, 2012, et cetera, et cetera, is when you really started seeing the whole recruiting game really started to get flipped upside down. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, for instance, up here, um, you know, B, let's face it, BC had first dibs on everybody. And I think they had it too good for too, too long. And 
you know, then a guy like Danny Dalton uh, makes this incredible one-handed catch at Gillette Stadium. Um, and it's the first clip on his huddle highlight reel. And just when BC thinks they have him locked up, Alabama gets a hold of it and flies a guy out here to make sure he's actually 6'5", 230. You know, and, and so I, 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 I think the best thing you can say about Huddle's disruption of, of the recruiting landscape is how many, how many guys Michigan offers around here now. And obviously, Don Brown being from Central Mass plays a big part in that. But when you, you consider how many, you know, cross-checkers you have um, in your recruiting operations, um, the fact that you can evaluate a kid from Boston and say, we can't find a guy like him in Detroit, let's go offer him. Um, that that's, I mean, that's really the power of what huddle has done. So, um, and I'm getting a little bit off track, but to your question about like marketing to Natick high school, the same way you would, you know, your, your South Lake Carroll, I, that's, it's just not, I, I don't, I don't think it's, it's like, um, look, Texas, Texas is like the SEC, right. And, and they're always going to be so much more advanced, um, I think the, the, the fun part of my job is, is finding a common ground. Um, and I, I think the way we've done that is, is really um, with some of the webinars I do, a lot of these guys, they, they get caught up in X and O's candy and they start talking jargon and vernacular. And, you know, that's fun to talk about. But if you don't know how you got to that conclusion, it's just kind of, like I said, candy. Um, and so we, we asked him a lot about like, why do you, you know, track this data point in your, your hollow reports? Why do you, you know, why, why do you look at that alignment that way? Why do you track 60 columns of data? You know, why are you arranging it this way? And it's a fascinating, it's often a fascinating look into people's mind, um, the way they think. That's kind of been my approach. Um, you know, uh, somewhat like, again, the rest of the country seems like it takes this stuff way more seriously than we do in New England. Um, I mean, I, I was talking to a guy in Kansas City a while back who worked on an algorithm in an Excel spreadsheet for three years that all he has to do is press a couple of buttons and every single uh, every single call on the play sheet on, on every kid's individual personalized play strip changes, like, you know, snap. Like, it's just crazy stuff. Uh, there's a guy I know there's another guy I wrote about uh, my first year at Huddle that is a, his day job is a project manager at Citibank in Cincinnati. And by night, he's a, uh, he's an assistant defensive coach at a high school in Northern Kentucky, where he has 50 data points on every single play from the school since 2006. And he came up with a model that can predict, he claims can predict his opponent's play calls 65% of the time. And that, that year that they predict the 65% they were, they won their third straight, uh, one, a title. So, and that's just a guy, uh, screwing around with, with, with finance tech stuff from city Bank and, and putting together crazy algorithms. Um, you, you know, so the, 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 the fun part of my job is, is creating a, a, a messaging that can, that can speak as well to your, your coach from Natick who's in it for the labor of love as you do from, you know, your, your coach that's got a company car and being paid $120,000 to coach high school football, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's fun, but um, God, it beats plumbing, doesn't it? I always think of like football coaches, especially high school and college is like kind of like a different animal, like speaking a different language. And I'm always curious, like with people who like, clearly your football knowledge is high, yeah. but for people who aren't football coaches, like, do you find, that you can speak the same language as these guys and that these guys are welcoming to have like conversations about, about what's going on with their teams. I think the most difficult part of this stuff uh, is, and this is to relate it back to here. This is why I always thought John DiBiaso is like the best coach around here it's because um, a guy like him can communicate what's an otherwise complex scheme to 15, 16 year old kids in a language that really anybody can understand. And that's a lot more difficult than people give her credit for. Um, I, I, I wanna say it's a Mark Twain quote about, I didn't have time to write you a letter, so I wrote you a four page letter. I mean, that, that's kind of, um, you know, 
a lot of people get hung up on like the 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 the, the volume of their data. It's really about the right data and about how to how to extract that and communicate that. Uh, one one exercise I see I see coaches do is they will they'll put together a one page tip sheet. Like here's your TLDR. You know, they're 80% run on, 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 on third and long, you know, at this point of the field, you know, watch for this. That's, that's stuff that's way more, way more applicable to us, to a high school kid than, you know, talking a, a, a crazy language that, um, I mean, sometimes I, uh, one of our partners, Coach Vass said at best that, that, that football is kind of like law school where there's so much acquired knowledge you have that you actually don't ever do anything with. <laughs> um, but really, I, I, I think that's the real trick is, is you know, um, th this stuff is really, it, it's a lot more complex than we'd think and we give it credit for because they're not, you know, MIT scientists, but really it's, it's all relative. And the better you can communicate that to the kids in a language that is kind of universal that everyone can easily digest honestly the better the coach you are i think so what about i'm curious i know you know you're focused on football but do you see like data analytics in high school sports and like basketball i'm sure baseball will get there because it's such a huge wave professionally but like what do you think huddle's role is going to be in other sports with analytics for high school yeah i mean it's, it's already there kind of um i, I mean the, the trickle down with basketball is is kind of ever, ever since the Warriors really burst onto the scene, the, the the cats out of the bag, and everyone really started going for that 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 three ball style, the the running gun, um, and the analytics back it up. Right, they say that you know your your highest points per per attempt is is at corner three, and I think your next highest is any other three from any other part of the floor. Um, I think that was that famous the damn analytics rant from uh, Mike D'Antoni's 73 year old brother. You yeah. know, if he can get into it, what is, what is your excuse as a, as a 40 year old teacher, you know, trying to educate kids. There's a guy, um, you know, I, I did a whole series last year. Um, we call it DNA of a stat where it's just basically a huge landing page where we really break down um, all the different advanced analytics we do um, for the hot assist package for, for basketball. You know, we do the, you guys heard of the four factors. You know what that is? No, no, I don't think so. Uh, it, it, it's it's a it's a popular theory with um, I forget who came up with it years ago, but that these that the the, the four uh, you know the four biggest uh, turning factors in winning a game is effective field goal percentage, which is basically a weighted field goal percentage to account for three pointers, um, give it, give them more value, um, but offensive rebounding percentage. Um, free throw factor, which is, you know, how many times you, you, uh, you, you get to the line and then uh, turnover percentage. So like educating people about that, um, you know, uh, you know, sideline efficiencies, uh, uh, baseline efficiencies, as far as out of bounds plays, which the Brad Stevens and me is already twirling. But um, I, I think the big one is, 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 is plus minus, maybe not, the individual stuff might not tell a story. Like people were like, I forget it. Maybe it was Chris Mannix who was talking about the night that Tyler Harrow uh, uh, killed the Celtics and buried them. Um, he was a minus four in a night, I think, or something like that. But like, there's no question Tally Hero was like just on fire that night. But I think where where plus minus is really effective is with, with measuring uh, which lamps work best. Um, so you're already, you're already seeing a lot of that. Um, deep data dive um and i know at the nba level they go absolutely nuts with it but there's there's plenty of stuff within that that you can apply at the high school level and um you, you know the and, the and the beauty of our reports actually not, not to keep pumping the tires but um is when you get those reports from our analysts um every single piece of data on that report you get on that big sheet um calls up a playlist so like all right so uh, so and so was six or seven on field goals. Okay, let's see. Let's see what he did on those field goals. And that and so that saves a crap ton of time when you're doing post game analysis because um, you have what usually 24, 48 hours to the next game during the middle of the season. So 
think about how how crucial that can be to, to helping you clean up some mistakes. Uh, I know your, your buddy Alex Gallagher at Noble and Greeno is a big big proponent of huddle assist. Um, he's a big big into that analytics stuff. So, um, yeah, listen, Alex uh, Alex spoke to our company uh, two summers ago and absolutely brought that house down. Guy, I. I I'd listen to him read his grocery shopping list, put it that way. Um, He's a good motivator. Uh, fantastic motivator. Um, yeah, so I think you're already seeing a lot of it. And be, because it, it's easy to, I, I, I think kids now are more curious than them. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? If you can say, uh, so there's a high school coach in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, um, that I, I talked to for the series who says he's the youngest state championship winning coach in Louisiana history. And he says that, you know, we attempt 27, 28, three points a game. The team that wins the effective field goal percentage battle wins 95% of high school games. So when you have that information in your pocket and you've got kids wondering why we're doing what we're doing, why are we attempting some of these? Well, if you win this battle, you win 95% of that. Think about how easy it is to get buy-in when you have empirical evidence to back it up. Um, another one I love is in the NFL, 90% of games that feature a block punt are won by the team that blocks the punt. Don't you think you tell it to a, to a group of high school kids about how important it is to pay attention on special teams and they'll really pay attention? So I, I, I think coaches are seeing that like this is kind of the – this is a great way to bridge difficult conversations. You think about, right, how curious kids are, but also like the parents, right? Parents will drive you nuts. They want to, they, 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 they want to speak to the manager, right? Um, this, is kind of, this is kind of the arbitrary equalizer. This takes the bias out of it. Uh, this says, look, you know, I, I don't think, I, I think you need to improve in this area and the stats show it. And then here's, here's how it looks on the playlist. And that's incredibly powerful to be able to combine video and data like that. Brendan Hall, a uh, lesson in life, career, and sports <laughs> analytics all wrapped up in one. We appreciate you, you a lot, and we really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Anytime, Greg. Love talking to you, buddy.